Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to give you today a little bit uh, overview what what we do in East and Central African Republic, also then to continue discussions and also potential collaboration and just to to give you an idea about how how we work there and what are the potentials and what are the the constraints. So I work for African Parks, a big organization uh, based in Southern Africa, and at the moment they manage 20 national parks in Africa, and with the goal to increase that in the next years, maybe 2030, 30 up to 450 parks, depends a little bit. As you said, Thierry Avisher, I'm Swiss and I studied actually in Switzerland. So today I would like to go with you through a little bit um, uh, over you, the locality and what makes Cinco so unique. The history, because I think it's very important to understand a little bit the context, the biodiversity, what's about it, and the threats, because there are threats and how we can address them, what we actively do at the ground, and a little bit the bigger plan and the bigger vision for long term. So starting with the locality and also the uniqueness, here a map of Africa where we <laughs> see the road network. And what is very clear is the northern savannah belt, is actually predominantly occupied by humans. Western Africa, every orange line that you see is a major road. And interestingly, there is a place in the Eastern Central African Republic. This is this country that is really in the heart of Africa. The name in the local language, um, uh, Sango means Be Africa. It's literally the heart of Africa. I think it's a very good name. And here you see that the road network is significantly uh, less dense. And it's not like in the north where you have these big um, openings in the Sahara, where you have um, like dry land that is not productive. This is actually an equatorial area with woodlands and forests. And you see here, there's even a big river. So there's water, there's forest, there's grassland. So it's a productive environment. And this big river is the Chinko River that gives the name to our project. So when we look now, we have forests, we have savanna. There are even approaches from different colleagues, like from WCS, where they try to other than have an idea, okay, we can say in Western Africa, you have forest or grassland. In Central Africa, you have forest or grassland. But can we even go a little bit more into the detail? And they try to use a lot of remote sensing data to have an approach to then have an estimation what is the ecological like um, health of these forests. So for that, you use the, the buffer around the roads about accessibility, settlements, also like transformation, like um, forest cuts or agriculture. They did that on a large scale, on a global scale. And when you look now in, in Africa, in Western Africa is predominantly heavily fragmented and um, uh, with high impact from humans. So most of the colors that you see in these analyzes is brown, means uh, very, very degraded and, and um, uh, actually poor in, in ecological functioning. Light green means there are still forests, but already heavily affected by humans. And only the dark green means forests or woodland savannas that are close to pristine or ecologically still um, uh, intact. And it's very obvious that the Central African Republic and especially the Eastern part is, is the largest continuous zone of, a, of, of like a natural primary vegetation, be it a rainforest or a woodland savanna. Now, interestingly, this is true for the entire old world. Even if we add now the rainforest in Sumatra, in Borneo, or even Papua New Guinea, even the Eastern part of Brazil at that scale, the Eastern Central African Republic is by far the largest tropical vegetation in a pristine state. And I think that's something that is, 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 is unique and something that is worth uh, putting a little bit of attention. So when you look, there is a area of roughly 204,000 square kilometer that is not occupied by humans. There is no major road, there's no agriculture, there's no settlement in this huge area in between the Central African Republic, South Sudan, Sudan, and then adjacent to the Chad. Now, just to give you an idea, this is the size of roughly Uganda. So there is an area without any human footprint that is the size of Uganda. And if I plot Uganda into Europe, that would mean that from Grenoble to like Milan, to like Frankfurt, to Salzburg, that would be an area without one human being that is permanently in a settlement or does agriculture or have a major um, uh, logistical road. 
also to give you a little bit of scale, when we look here at Central Africa, the eastern part, I just plotted Switzerland in it that you get a rough idea. So there's almost two times Switzerland that is in the heart of this wilderness that we see. Or we can do the opposite. We can plot Central African Republic, and that would be a wilderness that starts in Airolo. Chinko at the moment would be on the level of Airolo, and you would be able to fly or walk if you if you want to Frankfurt without crossing one road, without having one human sign. And the wilderness goes up to Dortmund when you would see it in scale. <coughs> so that's just for giving you a little bit an idea of like what is the locality look like and what is the uniqueness of this area. Now, when we go on the history, I think it's very important to have some context. Question is, how is it possible that such a productive landscape is empty? The, the answer to that is quite a massa. Centuries of slave trade with the last peak around 9, 1890, where Arab slaves really pillaged the area and collected the last human beings in this region. And that was only the last big wave. Most likely it started even in Egyptian time where just everybody traded the neighbor to not be the victim of the slave trades. So there was a chain effect going on. And at the end, it was Central Africa, the region that was got evacuated from all human beings. And all the local cultures, they collapsed that is around 1900 when the last big slave trade took place in this area. On top of it, at that time, around 1900, 1920, there were big epidemics of um, sleeping sickness and diseases that is provoked by tsetse flies. And that created then the last villages that survived these waves of, of, of um, uh, slave trades. And that put then the people along the main road where the French government then tried to, to have healthcare systems and that again evacuated the area. That's why today we have this huge area that is empty of humans. Interestingly, the Central African Republic actually has a long history of nature conservation, let's say at least on paper. The French mm -hmm. government already decided in 1924 to put a part in the East aside for the conservation of the two rhino species. Funny enough, they mentioned that as the official reason. They never send a manager at the ground. They never send somebody to even check if they are rhinos or not. But they put it aside, had a little um, a sign on the map. There's a Mongo reserve. And this is maybe the best example of a paper park. Since 1924, this park is in every map. And everybody calculates in a protected area, analyzes with this park. But until today, there was no management. There was nobody at the ground that actually did something for this reserve. Interestingly, also at the Independence Day around 1960, they had a very strong conservation legislation. And this law for conservation is surprisingly beneficial for nature. So much, much more powerful than what we have, for example, in Switzerland. They put a big part of the country aside for conservation and for sustainable harvest. And just the normal rule, how you should deal with nature would be on the level that most countries put aside for national parks. And this law is 1960, the first version, 1980, a second version, and 2020, the government did, again made a statement that they actually want to have a very strong nature conservation law. That led to the situation that the initial land use plan for the Central African Republic put the big part of the north and the east aside for natural vegetation with the goal to have reserves like Bamingi Bangoran, Gundas and Flores, Yatangaya, and Semongo. And all these areas in yellow and orange were hunting zones, where the idea was to keep natural vegetation, keep wildlife, but use it for sustainable trophy hunting. Again, it's important to put that in scale. The Central African Republic decided to put a land from Paris to Dortmund to Munich to Airolo under conservation. What went wrong? Because we can now ask on paper, everything seems to be fine. And now Central African Republic should be known as the most important conservation area in Africa. But when you look in the literature, you will find the opposite. So the question is what went wrong? First thing that happened that hit the area was in 1980 around the last big outbreak of rinderpest. And that killed most likely 80 to 95% of the local hip hop population, buffalo population, Eland, and whoever got affected by rinderpest. Another big event was around the same time, 
when Janjaweed, so a soldier from the Darfur region, came down mm -hmm. and slaughtered the elephant population within a few years. And that's for the civil war between Khartoum and Darfur. And that emptied the area. We have to assume that maybe 80 again to 90% of the elephant, elephant population crashed in like 10 to 20 years. So that was one of the biggest massacre of, of, of elephants for ivory trade. That was more the, the main uh, resource for the war going on. On the same time, they brought the local elephant population to crash, but they also eliminated the white rhino, the black rhino that were in this area, and the Kordofan giraffe. So around 1986, we have to assume that the Eastern Central African Republic lost the majority of elephants and all these mega herbivores here. Interestingly, after that big wave of poaching, it was quite silent, no people at the ground. So all the medium-sized antelopes and the buffalo, they actually recovered very quickly. So it became a paradise for the biggest antelope, like here, the giant eland. And around 2000, in the north, there were already problems with like increasing uh, poaching, increasing uh, livestock. So the Eastern CR became attractive for big game hunting. And around 2006, uh, my colleague Eric Mararf started uh, a big game hunting concession in Chinko area. And for until 2015, he ran the operation where they were harvesting wildlife for having trophy. And that was at that time a big economical value for the country. They paid taxes to shoot one of these eland. Approximately, a, a hunter pays 50,000 euro to have access to shoot one of these animals. Interestingly, despite this hunting going on, there was almost no information available for conservation or for biology. I checked, for example, databases. Here, a database of the bird species of the world. You see the more red, the higher the species diversity, the more greenish, bluish, the poorer the environment compared. Also, and therefore, also the fewer species you have for birds. It's a little bit self-explanatory that you have in the Sahara few birds and a lot of birds in the, in the humid areas, mountain areas, that makes sense. Interestingly, you have then the situation that you see a greenish, bluish island in Central Africa, where people assume a very low diversity of birds. Interestingly, also for fish species, there is an IOCN research um, uh, like paper summary about freshwater systems from 2011. And they concluded that the Congo River is by far the most species rich um, uh, river when it comes to, to fish. So around 200 to 360 species. Interestingly, they put the tributary Chinko, Mbari and Uara River as zero fish, the same value as a Saharan desert. <laughs> that would never be the case if there would be people that would knew the area, there would be a big outcream of like, that's impossible. But this publication had like hundreds of, of, of reviewers, hundreds of scientists that were contributing and it got published and everybody was happy to assume that one of the major tributaries of the Congo, the Ubangi, has a big river and he has zero fish. That just shows how neglected this area is. What um, uh, for me and my colleague Raphael was striking, when we looked what data is available in the same publication, you find this graphic where they say for one of the dragon, the group that is very well known, the dragonflies, these are all the studies that were done in Africa that we use this database. And then there are other public publications that show where the information comes from bat, another very well organ, um, uh, studied taxonomical group. And what you can see is there's zero research done in this, wide, in this wilderness between Eastern CR and South Sudan. And so basically what I found in this research database is a so assumption that there is nothing, but nobody ever checked or ever made an effort. That brings us to the point three. So what is in Eastern CR and what can we say about the resources and the biodiversity there? We started to work in 2011, 2012. The goal was that um, uh, I and Raphael went to Central African Republic, asked Eric Mararf to have access in his hunting zone to do an inventory. We tried to use whatever we could um, uh, use. Most of the things we did by foot, we had to walk. Sometimes you could use the, the road network that the hunters had. 
and sometimes he used the boat. The idea was to do an inventory and to use smartphones to then record data from transits, to put camera traps, to have an idea of what's going on in this neglected landscape. <laughs> Here, as you all know, camera traps, what we did is like we put camera traps in different areas, in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west, in the forest, in the savanna, grassland. We try to cover the area. This gives us an information what animal occurred in the area, gives us an idea of the date and the time, and even some ecological, maybe relevant data like uh, temperature. Animals are not um, affected by the camera traps, so that allowed us to even study animals that that were hunted over long time periods. They were super shy in high grass, think they um, thick vegetation. It's only because we use camera traps that we had access to these ghost animals, because you can walk easily days and weeks in Central Africa without seeing any big mammal. But with camera traps, we had access to even the most secretive living animals like the bongo antelope, big ears, very good smelling. So it's very difficult to approach them in the forest, but with camera traps, you get information, you know when they are there, the population structure, how they move, when they move, all this information. We have a little publication about the Caracal cat group. So interestingly, within one square kilometer, we found the golden cat that is normally a species in the equatorial rainforest belt. But we found also then the cerebral cat that is normally known for the humid savanna around the rainforest belt. And then the caracal that is known for being in rocky areas in quite arid landscapes. But in Chinko in the Eastern CR, we found all these typical species of a typical landscape in one square kilometer. And that can be explained by this ecotone we are in between the massive um, rainforest block in the central Congo Basin and the big savanna in the north. And this area here has in the south predominantly rainforest and in the north mostly um, savanna. But then it is a mosaic and is highly fractured, highly um, uh, um, fragmented, but it's a natural fragmentation. This system was most likely in these ecotone states since 160,000 years. So it's an old, naturally fragmented habitat that is pulsing. When it's a humid area um, a period, forests go, go, grow bigger. When it's a dry um, a, um, a period, the forests shrink along the rivers. But we can assume that in the, at least in the last 40,000 years, we have data from the Mbari River, one of the drainage where, we to, uh, where sediment were taken. And there were always forests, always savanna, always grasslands in the last 40,000 years in this area. And we can then see that this changed a little bit the assumption that we had about a lot of species. Here is the distribution of this um, gray throated trail, uh, um, a rail. It is a species that was uh, that people thought that its ecology is highly bound to tropical rainforests, all grown primary forests. And we found it significantly in the north in this little gallery forest of the Congo Basin. On the other hand, we had species that were well known in the Sahelian dry savanna belt, but again, we found it massively more south at the edge of the forest, like this pygmy sunbird. So in this ecotone of different forest fragments, sometimes big, sometimes small, sometimes isolated, sometimes connected, and the same with the savanna woodland, sometimes isolated as an island in the forest, sometimes open, connected to the north, and that creates an extreme high diversity. When you look at birds, we have 11 species of hornbills. 10 of them can be found in sympatry. So you can find literally at the edge of a forest, you can find in one day 10 species of hornbills that used the same matrix. The same with the with a bee eater. There's only one that I put here a little bit light because I still have to confirm he's there. I'm 100% sure he's there but we still have to search at the moment 10 species of um, uh, bee eater confirmed in one square kilometer, but we have to find this guy, it's a little bit difficult. Um, and we still find species, so that's true for mammals, it's true for, for birds, it seems the pattern is very typical. Here a crocodile, the, the slender snouted crocodile, was assumed to be only in, uh, in the Congo Basin, in the, in the inner part, in the rainforest belt, but we found the species now in the tributaries in the high uh, um, uh, parts of the Chinko River. So that means that 
there is significant diversity that was not covered. And now you just have to assume that whenever you use global data about biodiversity, you will calculate with this bias. So you will always, whatever cool algorithm you use and whatever cool uh, correction factors you use, at the end of the day, when you take the biodiversity layers, you will most likely always punish big wilderness that we're not interested in <laughs> because people have no data about it. And just for example, when you see what you could assume, I think the assumption was not wrong. The Congolian rainforest is really reaching the most northern tip of its extensions in Chinko. So you could assume that the forests here must be very poor and maybe not even relevant for conservation. So why spend effort to go there? So I tried to have an idea how, how, how much of the Congolian rainforest we cover in the Chinko area. I use the micro rainforest as one of the biggest forest blocks that is connected to mountain areas. It's most likely a refuge that had in the last millions of years always at least some forest fragments. So if you look what are the species that are bigger than 100 gram, you come up with this diverse uh, species assemblage of like marine forest species. That's the situation in Chinko. So that's micro, that's Chinko. So basically, we can say that 76% of the diversity that you expect on the bigger mammals, on the bigger birds, on the bigger uh, reptiles that are around, are actually present at the edge of this rainforest, where we know that there was a lot of dynamics in the last part, um, uh, past um, uh, millions of years. So that shows that these forests are actually, at least for fa the fauna, very relevant. And you can protect a big fraction of the diversity in these gallery forests. But that also shows that if you want to preserve okapi and gorillas, you need to go to the Congo Basin and also have an effort in these refuge forests. We did some camera trap data analysis. We used our um, uh, species like the diker, a very diverse um, uh, assembly of eight different species. And what we wanted to see is actually to understand their ecology, how can they live together? So green means typical forest species. These are typical savanna species and typical ecotone species. Now we wanted to see if we can see that in our data. So when we distributed our camera traps over the rainforest to the savanna from the west to the east, we tried then to have an algorithm to see what is the, the likelihood to find a certain species in a certain habitat when we looked what was the, the environment around this camera trap spot. And here we can see, clearly see that the bay diker, for example, he likes and prefers the forest and he actually avoid savanna areas or forests that are extremely isolated. Same is true for the white bellied diker, same pattern, a little bit less restricted as the bay diker is the veins diker. And here is savanna species, the common diker, where the, the signal is flipped. He avoids forests and actually likes open woodlands. Interestingly, we can also see now with camera trap data, when do they actually, uh, when they are active, the bay diker clearly a nocturnal species. So almost no activity in the daylight hours and a lot of activity more than expected between midnight and six o'clock in the morning and between six o'clock in the evening and midnight. These two species seem to be extremely diurnal, so they are almost always sleeping in the night and very active during the day. Very similar pattern between vein diker and white belly diker. And then we have also species that are more crepsilar. So we have uh, early morning activity, late in the evening activity, but almost no activity during the night or at the heat of the day. So with this data, we can actually use nature made a natural <coughs> experiment and we can actually study species that are in a fragmented habitat not influ influenced by humans, but just showing their real ecology. And interesting is we can then make analyzes and see how do they overlap. And these two species, for example, seem to almost not overlap. So they live together in the same habitat. They both are forest species like a tall forest, a primary forest, but this one is during the day, this one during the night. So they actually don't interfere. These two species, our forest species, live in the same forest and seems to heavily overlap. And that's maybe the reason why this species is 10 times more common than that one. Seems that there's a lot of competition and that one is a little bit more dominant. So this species becomes 10 times less common. 
this is relevant for us because we have a lot of bush made hunting and that's for example as a, as a, as a knowledge to know that this species is much much more common so can be higher harvested than for example certain species that are more at the edge already from their ecological community point of view we also had some surprises here uh, white and manap pigeon that was a species where um, ornithologist says that the, the ecology is mountain refuge forest in the Albertine Rift and then some isolated little populations in the Cameroonian highlands. Funny enough, we find these species very commonly in the lowland of Chinko. Little forest, savanna, open land, very common species between 500 and 700 meters above sea level. So that shows us that we most likely just didn't understood the, the, the ecology of this bird species. Here, the data that we published in iNaturalist, you can check that. The points are actually hidden because it's a species that is near threatened. But what I wanted to show you is we find them in the forest. This point were actually here and here. This one was here. And even in the north, so this species seems to occur in this entire mosaic of rainforest, woodland, savanna, and grassland. So these species seem to be an ecotone species, if I would um, uh, define his ecological niche and not a refuge species that is associated with, for, with mountains as it is found in the literature. Now, maybe for you, also interesting, we have migratory birds and a lot of these birds were not supposed to be in the Central African Republic. Here's the distribution that is mostly accepted. And we found, for example, the, the rufous-tailed rock thrush in Chinko, and it seems to be a very common bird. So in the in the winter time, we see it all over the place. So there must be thousands, hundreds, thousands of individuals because without making effort, you see them all over the place. And for me, quite a funny bird because I associate them always with like mountains and green hills. And sometimes you see them in 45 degrees with like eland antelopes and quite interesting. Then also the common red star, very common uh, migratory bird in Jinko. Again, officially in the databases available, they exclude the Central African Republic as a winter habitat for this bird. Then more um, uh, as we expected, common nightingale that was actually in the expected uh, range of the winter habitat. We can confirm lots of birds some, uh, are during the dry, uh, during the winter time, during the dry season in Central Africa in this area. The same with the Eurasian Brineck, very common. So I think that there must be quite a significant amount of the population staying out in Eastern CR because it's a very common bird that you see without making a lot of effort. So basically when we put all this diversity together, we see that this assumption that, West, that Eastern Central African Republic is lower and less diverse than the surrounding areas like the Northern Congo and Cameroon doesn't hold. At the moment, we have 461 confirmed species. And interestingly, 50% of all these species were out of the, of the distribu distribution map in this biodiversity <laughs> layers. And I think I'm not a good birder. Uh, two other people, including Roman, worked with me on the bird list, but we actually counted lions. So we never really spent time to do the birding work. So I'm pretty sure that in Eastern CR, we will end up with a list that will be close to 600 species because there are a lot of species that I certainly don't cover at the moment. So we need to put a red dot in the Eastern CR to update this biodiversity lens. Now, there's a lot of confusing things going on. We don't know. This is a white stock, for example, that I observed um, uh, at the 22nd of May in the middle of, the, of, of Chinko in the area here. So in a nice um, uh, mosaic, we don't know really if it's a youngster or if it's a, a, a wrong guy or does he know that in Ukraine now it's not nice to stay? I don't know, but at the, at the end we have certain individuals, certain birds that are out of their normally migration time in Central Africa and we don't know really what that means and if they stay, if it's youngsters or what's going on. And then intra-African migration is also very badly covered. Aptim storks, very common, but sometimes you have thousands of them, sometimes zero. So there's a lot of movement, but I think nobody understands how they actually move in between the Sahel, in between the rainforest belt. But we know that they sometimes are very present and sometimes literally absent in the area. 
Other observations, we have like the pennant wing night jar, and here the same. Officially, we are at the edge of the population of the distribution, but we have a huge population, so I think it's actually very good habitat. But we don't know. Even in July, I had some observations of like beautiful males that are courtshiping. They should be in South Africa and breeding. So I think we need to better understand the, the African internal migration and breeding pattern of this species. Now also just to show you, there are some fish species. That's me being in the Chinko River and just take pictures like that. Interestingly, there are oysters and these oysters create oyster banks. And sometimes it looks more like a tropical coral reef than a muddy tributary of the Congo rainforest rivers. And here on this picture, you see one, two, three, four bird, um, uh, fish species on one, one, one picture. So we counted so far 100 different species. But again, we only scratched at the surface. I think that it should be 150 to 200 species of fish that are in these rivers that are official in every database that you call a contact, contact will be zero. So my colleague did a little publication about the bias. So he looked what is the information that we get regarding biodiversity and where are these studies, like where, where come this, comes the data from? And you see there is a strong correlation between how wealthy a, a, a country is and how nice it is, because you, he measured it like, for example, also accessibility to beaches and like um, uh, the income. So it she clearly shows areas that are easy accessible, Uganda, Cameroon, Ghana, South Africa, there you have quite a lot of research. The more difficult it gets, the more civil war, the more uh, tiring it is to go to this area, the less information we have. And whenever you do an analysis regarding biodiversity on a global scale, you should keep that in mind. The biggest, most remote nature wilderness are the least known, and therefore the error will be most likely the biggest in these areas. And so we make, as scientists often, there are an error. We try to extrapolate and see where should we go, what is the pattern, and we neglect where we have no access and where we have no information. So we reinforce that we should go to Ghana, Cameroon, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa. So when we look now at the threats, there is biodiversity, there is value, are there threats? We already said poaching is a problem until very recently was the major issue. 2015, my camera traps regularly had pictures of Sudanese with AKs, with war guns. And they were still after elephants. Even after the population crashed, there were still people searching for the last elephants in this environment. At the moment, I know about 100 elephants in our area. There should be 40,000 in, in, in the Chinko Valley. At the moment, I know about 100. And in 2015, there were still a lot of people hunting down the last individuals. That is a main, main threat for especially the big mammals. Then we have this general problematic in the Eastern CR that it's the most unstable stable country that you can imagine. There are fragile states index for economic, economical advices, and they all put the Eastern CR and South Sudan, so where this wilderness is, as the most unstable and the most fragile area, and they highly recommend to not invest in this area because all investments, all efforts will be destroyed immediately. So that's also why I needed support, for example, from a new university, because going there is not easy. As a young student, if you want to go there, people say they will kill you and you will lose all our money that we invest into your research project. So it's actually very difficult to motivate people to help you to go to these areas. There are different armed groups. Here just a selection. Seleka from the north, rebels that are mixed between Sudan, Chad and Central Africa from the north by chance Muslims. <laughs> then we have the LRA, originally from, the, from Uganda, a Christian uh, military group. And then we have the Antibalaka that fights against the Seleka, the Christian group. And then on top of it, we have French army, we have the UN, we have the, the Russian Wagner groups. So interesting, in 2022, we have a proper uh, Cold War situation where the EU and Russia are trying to get hold of Eastern CR and CR in general and try to influence and be the guy that is at the ground. So a lot of instability, a lot of guns, a lot of violence in this context. That's a little bit the, the area that you 
working if you want to, to, to be at the ground in Eastern CR. The biggest threat for nature in general and habitats are most likely at the moment the, the unorganized destructive pastoralism. This is a new phenomenon because for centuries the Sahel was used as the, the production size for livestock. And these centuries of over harvest too many in livestock in a small area completely destroyed the ecosystem and, and lead to degradation of a once very product woodland and grassland area. And this increases now the conflict. There's a lot of conflict about grassland, about water, livestock, and agriculture. Overpopulation and uh, ecological catastrophe together then with violence create a massive movement of millions of people with dozens of millions of livestock that push now more and more into the south. They already reached the Congolian rainforest. And this is a situation that wasn't possible until very recently. There was the Tsetse fly belt and the Nagana diseases stopped the, the incursion of the, of the livestock because the losses were so bad that herders couldn't go into this with the humid woodlands. But with new treatment, all these cows are now pumped full with antibiotics and other medication, and they can now survive a dry season in the, in the humid savanna. So funny enough to know that all these cattle are maybe the worst treated animals that you can imagine. You are in the middle of a wilderness and you see a cow, but if you would take a sample, you would find doxycycline, suramine, you will find top 10 of the most, um, uh, yeah, like uh, the easy available chemicals that you find on planet Earth. That comes also with a lot of threats for wildlife. These herders normally don't use their cows. Sometimes they don't even own the cows. So they do a lot of poaching. Here, a typical um, uh, herder camp where you see the carcass of, a, of an eland and here dry meat that they transport them to Sudan or trade with the local population. They use full metal jackets, uh, or do you say like the army um, uh, um, uh, bullets. They are hard, they go into the body, go out, make just a hole. So most of the big animals survive uh, a shot like this bongo antelope and die later on somewhere. So that means it's a very destructive way of hunting, a lot of losses. And in five years, between 2012 and 2017, based on track count that I did in the area, we lost almost 80% of the buffalo of the eland, so the bigger, the bigger um, antelopes in the area. And that's mainly to direct poaching. Another problematic is the predators. So predators follow the livestock, especially when the wildlife becomes more rare. And the herders tolerate a certain amount of losses. After a certain amount, they use poison. And that is very efficient. That's a, a line that was poisoned in the north of the Jinko area. And here we, we noticed in 2012 what was like our baseline on the onset of this invasion of herders. And in 2017, we didn't find even a track on 1,000 kilometers that we walked of a lion. So we have to assume that we lost 90, 95% of the lion population in five years. Similar for wild dog, a little bit less for leopard and the least for um, uh, hyenas. Now on the habitat scale, this in mo uh, this movement of, of herders also have a profound effect on the, on, the, on the landscape. Here is a picture during the rainy season from the park. You see trees and you see grassland, so everything is green. Same situation, few minutes before, I flew outside of the park and there the government brought in cattle in 1950. And here you see only the trees survive and all the grassland is gone. This is bare ground. This is during the peak rainy season in August, bare ground. So it, the human induced desertification. And slowly, slowly trees will also die. We have satellite pictures where you see suddenly the, the soil, red soil, white soil, there should be a grass cover, but now you can see just the earth. And the data shows that there is significant deforestation. And this is not deforestation because somebody is cutting the trees. This is deforestation after the woodland savanna was so badly over harvest that now the recruitment of young trees is no longer possible. And when the, the trees start to die, it is a deforestation. And that is in our area localized, but this is a trend that goes from Senegal to Ethiopia and from the Sahel 
to the boundary of the Congo rainforest. Another problematic is the movement of these thousands of cows, millions of cows and sheep and goats. So they mainly come from the Darfurian area. They go through different main tracks to the south, even crossing the Congo uh, border. And these thousands of, of animals are not vaccinated. So there's a huge transport of well, all kinds of diseases. One of the problems is, for example, the bovine tuberculosis. This is a disease that can affect like dogs, cats, and other species, and at the end, also humans. And of course, wild dog, lion, all the, the hornbills, and at the end, also the elands and the buffalo in the area. So this is one of the problem in large scale when it comes to diseases. So after all this situation of what is the, the thing that we have and what are the problems, what can we do? The first thing we did is in 2014, we created a Chinko project that was um, uh, Raphael, me as the biologist, and then Eric Mararf and David Simpson as the, the big game hunters. Together we said it will not be possible to do trophy hunting on long term. We need to change the strategy. We need first to have conservation and later on we can continue with big game hunting or whatever is useful. So the first thing we did is we created a local NGO registered in Central Africa and then we tried to have an agreement with the government. And on the 13th June 2014, we could sign a, a, a paper of the government. Funny enough, it was elaborated with the former president. He got kicked out. It was the rebels that signed, and it was then the new government that agreed on the signature. So it was actually three different leaders that expect, expect, um, accepted this, this approach to have four hunting zones classified as conservation areas. First thing we did is applying the law. But how can we do that? We needed a big partner, and that's why we invented African Parks to take over Chinko as one of their parks in the portfolio and help us to manage it at the ground. So first we did is anti-poaching. We, we, we trained local um, people from the village. We gave them guns. We trained them how to do law enforcement. We used the law that was always there and we didn't have to invite any new rules or anything else. It's just the law that was always there. You're not allowed to have guns if it's not registered. You're not allowed to kill leopards. You're not allowed to use any poison. So just with the, with the existing law, we could do anti-poaching. These are smoked meat from fishermen that killed a lot of monkeys, including chimpanzees. But quickly we realized most of the people are not aware of the law. Even if that was 1960 when the law was written, even if it was 1972 when the hunting blocks were defined, Nobody at the, in the population was actually informed about all of that. So we realized that just application of law with guns will create a lot of conflict, will create a lot of troubles. We need another approach as well. That's why we hired unarmed people from the local population. They make signs along, around the boundary. They talk to the fishermen, talk to the poacher at the edge and say, where is the reserve? Why are we here? What is the goal? And at the moment, I have 60 echo teams under me, uh, 60 echo uh, agents in 15 teams. And they are doing the whole day nothing else than being at the periphery and try to make sure that everybody understands where the boundary are and what we are doing. Problematic was the Sudanese herders, they speak Arab and, and Fulbe, so the local people couldn't communicate with them. So we created a second team, the transhuman sensitization teams, we call them Tango, and they could speak Arab and Fulbe, and they were from the, the, the herders tribe, so they could approach the, the Sudanese, could talk in their own language, and could explain where the reserve is, what are the best paths to avoid the, the, the reserve, and how we could live together without having too much conflict. The strategy is based that we have at the moment 15 team, 60 agents for seven months in the bush. So we recruit them, we bring them to the, to, the, to the area and they are for seven months in the bush and we just let them uh, walk behind the cows. And that's the condition in which they live. So that's our, the real heroes of the, of the project and the real heroes of the, the achievement that we have. That's how the Sudanese move, um, move in this area. They are really mobile cattle herders. They all what they are, they belong is they can load it on a cow and move 
dozens of kilometers in a day. So that's why for having an idea, we have um, ultralight aircraft. We have three ultralight aircrafts that patrol during the dry season on a daily basis. And whenever they spot one of these herder groups, they give us the coordinates and we send them the Tango team that have bright yellow colors. So to show that they are not a threat and they go to the herders and explain, be careful, you are on the way to the park, better to go left or right, stay out of the boundary. Otherwise we will have to intervene and we have to send the rangers. To hate the communication, we give them salt a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar and tea so that they can start the conversation, a little bit of icebreaker. And often it leads to the situation that our agent can discuss, can also get the information, who they are, from where they are, where they are going, how many cows, how many people, how they are organized, what are their problems, what are their vision, a little bit in exchange. And this helps us to get from our kind of enemies all the information we need to make a strategy, a plan to then come up with solutions. That's what we try. And at the moment it works so well that we have a collaboration and often the leader of the herders accept to provide data, accept to share information so that we can talk to them and don't have just to use guns to push them out of the park. So we have an escalation strategy we try to go to the communities and explain them what is Chinko, what is the conservation approach. Then we have people that are still in the communities and they explain to the people that come through these villages. Then we have our airplanes that search for cows in the periphery of the park. Then we send our mobile tango teams. If the people don't react, we reinforce and send another tango team. If that doesn't work, one of the leaders goes with the helicopter, makes a meeting at the ground. And if that not hurt, that helps, then we send the ranger that are armed and they will then um, uh, um, uh, confiscate illegal uh, material like guns or cables or whatever belongings they have or uh, uh, cows at the, at the last edge. So we try to use all kinds of data, long-term remote sensing data like deforestation, close to real-time fire data, and then information from our ground teams that gives us a daily update. And we use that every evening, we combine every information we have and we make a strategy for the next day, how we react to the current situation. That was the situation in 2016. Every orange line is an aircraft that was taking a survey and every dot is a poaching camp, a poacher, a herder or a cow. 2017, it looked like that. 2018, 19, 2019, 20, 2021. So we could start from a little kernel that we started after two years of preparation. We signed the contract in 2014, it took us two years to be ready to react. A little core zone could be kept free of livestock and illegal activities. And gradually we increased the, the, the actively managed area. Here you see the last um, uh, situation from this year, dry season 2021-2022. These are the pressure that we have from livestock and illegal activities, and roughly 6,000 square kilometer could be kept without any human activities. So here a little bit is the, the, the evolution from like 5,000 in 2016 to like 25,900 square kilometer actively managed and secured for wildlife in 2021-2022. This thing you can even see from the air. So if you want to double check what we do, this is just the firms in the fire data. And this is between the 23rd December 22, 21, the 20 to January 22, 21. And this hole is just no fire active in the Chinko because everybody makes fire, hunter, uh, like the, the herders, everybody walks in the high grassland and they make fire. So having no fire means nobody was walking there. So this is maybe the honest measurement of if you have an impact on large scale. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case before we started to work. As I said, 2016, we weren't ready. We had only a little core zone. So we hadn't any impact on the fire. 2019, we actually, could manage the fire at the area. So that shows that there was a change between no management and late on management. Big question is now, does that change for wildlife? 
Here, the data that we collected for the leopards, for example, 2012 track count data, 2017 steep decline since 2016, uh, since 2018, a gradual increase. Here, the data is best. So I think that's the, the real pattern for lion, same system. The wild dog is so rare that if you miss one track, you actually have these funny things. So here is a little bit of problem of effort. Then for the large wildlife, it's the same well, herbivores. Here, for example, we have the, the, the run, the um, um, eland, level heart beast, and pongo. The pattern is all the same. A lot of increase, a decrease because of herders. Active management brings the population slowly, slowly back. So now when you put a camera trap, you will see there's a lot of movements of wildlife in the same solid reproduction, animals moving during the day, different species. You see new things. This is a bachelor herd of giant elands. These are only males, seven males hanging out together. When there was big game hunting, when there was poaching, we never saw something like that. So these are now new things that we see that nature comes slowly, slowly back and behaves as they should and not attach as, uh, as humans push them. Elephants were for a long time only ghosts. Even the camera traps only got night pictures when they were running in front of the camera, blurry things. Now we see during the day, elephants, even big tasks like with elephants with big tasks, walking relaxed in the area, showing that there is no poaching anymore in the corso. Here, a symbolic picture from last year. This is a lion. We know lion, we lost a lot, so it was difficult to even get a picture of them and high grass in the end of January. So that shows nobody walked there, nobody lighted the fire and the lion slowly comes back. Now a little bit, what is the bigger picture? Because we could, we could show it's possible to do conservation. Now the problem is sometimes as conservationists, you get heavily criticized for that because they say it's militarization, you use guns against local people. Who gives you the right to actually keep a big area free of humans? So lots, lots, lots of, of criticism for nature conservation, especially when it's on large scale. That's why African <coughs> Parks tries to have a long-term strategy. The goal is clear. We want to have the wilderness as such preserved. And there should be a bigger vision for the government, for the region, that that should remain wilderness. At the same time, the surrounding area where we have villages, where we have roads, there should be a development and the economical benefit from this wilderness, from the natural resources. So we try to have compromises and come up with solution where we define core zones as known access area conservation zones. And then within the conservation area, we have the corridors where we try to find a way how herders can path, can use a sustainable grazing rotational system to not over harvest, to not destroy the corridor, so that we can then still live as neighbors. They can go from south to north or then from east to west without going into the most fragile ecological areas and without having the effect of spreading diseases. Same time, we could have some uh, logistical places where we put uh, in, um, infrastructure in place to have vaccination. We try to discuss that with the leaders of the Sudanese um, herders. Here, a meeting in the, in the middle of the bush that we organize with the helicopter, where we exchange. These people refuse to accept our, our strategy. Then we talk to them after a little bit of effort. They saw, okay, that's a good idea. Let's try to find a way. So it is actually collaboration on this level. We try to include the local um, administration, local herders, farmers, so that we make a round table so everybody can talk and everybody can contribute. The idea is to come up with a land use plan where we have a core zone protected, some transhumans corridors, a buffer zone between the reserve and the community, but then also agriculture land that is clearly defined so that the effect, the conflict between um, uh, herders and farmers and the reserve is minimized. That's a little bit what we try to put in place. A lot of ideas, how to um, make better agriculture that uses less resources, fertilizing the landscape with um, uh, charcoal and with um, uh, biomass, 
letting some big trees staying so that actually you use less environment for production of agriculture. We try to, to put sustainable hunting in place in the periphery, where we try to have a, a hunting system that is sustainable. We invite people, even if civil war is there, we go out with our plane, collect people. These are 20 representative of local hunters. We did a two week um, uh, theoretical training. Then we did some practical work. And it's this kind of things that convince the people because they have not seen a eland in the last 15 years. And now they say, wow, if you can keep eelands at your place, let's try the same in the periphery where we are responsible. So there's a long way to go. The, the basic is very low. The people are not educated, very lot of, um, a lot of difficulties. At the same time, quite high motivation and at least a little bit of um, a spirit of hope that it is possible. We try to, to train um, uh, people from the government, people from the local fisheries, um, um, uh, fisheries to have then the local fishermen using less destructive methods, using uh, um, uh, systems that are not destroying the rivers, but are actually using the fish resource in a most convenient way. So what is the big vision? The big vision is to have a wilderness from the rainforest with high rainfall to the dry savanna areas at the edge of the Sahel, because that's the only area where we have along the latitude, a gradient of different habitats of different rainfalls. We can say that we have around eight different ecological zones from true rainforest to semi-Sahelian shrubland. And this gives us the, the possi possibility to have species that are adapted to dry condition, species that are adapted to humid conditions and all in between. And it's on a size where there is climate change, where there is changing environment that they can actually move that they can freely move and readjust their ecological needs so that they can survive even if there are major changes. And I think conservation should also include this kind of thinking processes and also climate change. Brings us back to the birds. A lot of bird species from the Paleoarctic suffer under climate change, but also destruction of habitats. The Sahel gets drier and drier. The woodlands gets more and more cleared. The forest gets more and more fragmented. So in the long term, the winter habitat of a lot of species are endangered. To have a continuous block from the Sahel to the rainforest that is natural vegetation might be a significant contribution to the, the conservation of Palearctic um, uh, magrat birds in long term. Just to show you a little bit what we really want to do, Often you have rainforest national parks and grassland national parks, little areas that are stuck in a situation. In Eastern CR, we have the situation where there is a valley, when there is a gorge, we have rainforest. Where there is a rocky shield, there is grassland. This is like the natural habitat. But on the same time, we have dry forest and woodland savanna, and there is actually a dynamic in between these habitats. So given the scale and given the, the, the dynamic that is still there, we can just put in place all the abiotic factors like late rainy season, late dry season fires that will put the system from dry forest to woodland, from woodland to grassland. But we can also account for human induced CO2 levels that increase where the system got pushed towards woodland, dry forest, humid forests. On top of it, there is the biodiversity that was a key player for a long time. So all the browsers push the system from wood forest to woodlands, from woodlands to grasslands. The grazer would actually push it from grasslands to woodlands, from woodlands to dry forests, from dry forests to rainforests. Problem is, in Eastern CR, we lost some of the key players. Black rhino, white rhino, giraffe completely gone. Elephants so low in numbers that they no longer play their ecological niche. That means that if we want to have this dynamic refunctioning, we have to bring back what we lost and we have to increase the population size. This is a little bit the way of African parks to think about this landscape that it's not about conserving, it's about preserving the dynamics, ecological, and evolutionary processes. 
that's also why we decided to increase the scale again for hunting zones that we protected in the first row. The river has its source at the border of Sudan. If we don't manage this area, ecologically, it will not function. That's why we signed another PPP in 2020, where the entire drainage system of the Chinko is now in an agreement and managed by African parks. This is maybe the largest tropical river that is from the source almost to his um, uh, to, um, uh, confluence with the big Uba, um, uh, Mbomu River under conservation. And that's the idea in long term. We linked the Samongo Reserve with the Yata Reserve on paper, gives us an opportunity to really do nature conservation on large scale. It will be one of the only occasions where you could have the headwaters of the Congo, the headwaters of the Chad Lake, and the headwaters of the Nile in a Transfrontier Park managed in a way that these water sources for three of the most important river systems in Central Africa are protected in long term. And this is a contribution towards the idea of having 30% of the world protected and to have large scale conservation, as a lot of very famous um, uh, scientists promote and, 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 and um, uh, declared as a, as a goal for humanity. We try to use species as a measurement. Here, the wild dog. This wilderness could be the only real continuous area that could harbor, harbor a population with any of 500 individuals that would be by itself over long term viable. And so, the wild dog is a little bit our, our species, our flagship species, and indicator to see if we succeed. Because in Western Africa, in the last 50 years, we lost almost every population of wild dogs, including in the WAP complex where we have still big areas that wasn't enough for the wild dog. So it must be in this area where we still have healthy population that we keep this species in long term. At the moment, we have roughly 10 packs, so at least 100 dogs very spread over the area. So this is definitely a species that we want to preserve and where we want to use as a indicator species, as long as they are around, we know that things are okay. Now, that's a little bit the long-term vision. Long-term vision is to have an approach for all this wilderness, combine what we already have, work together with existing reserves and create a transfrontier approach where the, the Nile Bassa, the Congo Bassa and the Chad Bassa are represented in a large scale approach. That's what I wanted to say about Central Africa, but I quickly add something because now you will say, oh, that's large scale and that's unique. And so what do we do here? And what can we do on this side? I just want to say, I'm happy that we can spend so much time and, and do this kind of work. But at the same time, I still think that there is a lot of work to be done in Switzerland. And I'm happy that a lot of people are working actually here. We have a lot of problems in Switzerland. Rivers are now dry, low, big troubles. Lots of people say that the, the species, um, like fish species go extinct. It's too hot, it's too dry. And when I speak to a lot of young people, especially in Europe, I feel that a lot of people say, well, it's done, it's over. It's climate change, we don't, we don't have any impact on that. As long as Russia and China is not um, following, what should we do, little Switzerland, it's done. I think it's important as scientists to show people climate change is one of very many threats. And I believe in most of the cases, it's only the little drop that let the thing overflow. Most of the time, it is a long history of degradation of habitat destruction that lead to the problem that we see today. So I think, for example, when we speak about rivers that are too hot or not enough water, climate change has its contribution. I'm pretty sure that Degrading humid um, uh, grasslands has a bigger impact, and most likely you can make more water and can cool down rivers much, much more if you would save what is still around and renaturate what we lost. And I think these are things that we should um, speak up and also keep a bigger vision for Europe. Europe should not be conservation 1950. Europe should be conservation how it was in the past. These were the main drivers of European biodiversity in the past. 
in Europe, sometimes you think it's a luxury thing and don't we don't speak about it. But these are the, the things that we need in Central Africa to run the show. These are the same elements that we would need in Europe to, to do the same. We know that there are keystone species that would be able to maintain grasslands, to maintain humid areas, to create open bare ground. A lot of things that we pay today farmers to do and that we say we need subvention, we need agriculture. This is actually work that nature did for us over centuries. So I think we should not be, be too narrow-minded. We should look at Africa. They have still the mega herbivores. We should try to mimic as much as we can and to re bring back whatever is possible. There are interesting projects where people try to use these old forces to manage landscape, like the Wiesenthal project in the Jura Mountains. It's also important to see this is not only conservation, that can be economy. When you look nowadays, what do we produce on a drained um, uh, humid grassland? Not a lot. If you would have a lot of wildlife, if you would produce bio-organic happy animals, that's meat, you can sell it, it's good quality. You can even have trophy hunters that would like to shoot a big deer or a big um, uh, um, uh, elk or a big um, um, uh, uh, recent. So I think that there is a lot of options. We pay a lot of money to maintain European woodlands and European um, uh, humid areas like the, the Neuchâtel um, uh, sea border. These are areas where we have square kilometers available to actually do much, much more of rewilding of, of, of sy systems that would actually work on the same scale as we, we see it in, in Africa. The Senza River, still a river that is 22 kilometer connecting the lowland with the meadows in the highland. So these are all potential situations <laughs> where we actually can make a big effort and do nature conservation in a functioning, in a process-oriented approach, and not in a like emergency scale where we try to preserve a thing as it is today. Because there will be changes, there will be massive changes. We need to think how nature can adapt to major changes. And we need to do that in Africa, we need to do that in Europe, we need to do that on a global scale. I like to finish with like an uh, old saying in Africa, when the tree falls, you hear it. When the forest grows, no sound. It's a little bit our time that we read a lot of bad news, a lot of everything that you hear from Central Africa is normally war, problems, and failure. But at the same time, you can work aside. You can build up slowly, slowly something, and nobody notices until it is there. So I think for young people, very important, have your vision, try to do whatever you think is necessary, Take your time, and I think there's more possible than we normally think. Thank you very much. He has spoken a lot, and you, you can ask a few questions because I think, uh, thank you, Terry. It was somehow a glimpse of hope, but also a little bit scary. Um, Thank you very much. I have respect for your work and thank you for a nice talk. I was wondering, um, you, in some way, you almost take over politics in this area. Uh, is there another problem that you might like even compete with the local politicians? I mean, if the national park goes to the border, you, you take over border control uh, functions almost. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the big threats also that you, you, should not, you should not put nature conservation into politics or economy on that level. It happened even we have some parks where we struggle a lot. African parks has, for example, Panjari in the Benin situation. Uh, a lot of jihadism with, with the government fighting back. And, and there, for example, I think we didn't keep the border clear between conservation and uh, politics. So it's a big problem in conservation, you're right, and we need the strategies to do that. In Chinka at the moment, it's also the motivation to try to not getting into this politics and say, we have an agreement with the government to do nature conservation. Nature resources are what we are interested in and where we are the experts. And we try to have every stakeholder part of the story. But the border control is not what we do. 
we say this area is, is designed for having nature conservation. So if you come and you do something against nature, we react, but we don't control the border uh, on that level. And that needs to be clear also for the neighbor that it's not against them. It's the idea to keep the natural resources for everyone. And what we try to do now, we start in Central Africa, but we, now, we try now to include Sudan, South Sudan, and have the technicians with the politicians just working together on the same goal so that it doesn't become a border control. It should be more that the Sudan, South Sudan, and CR have actually the same goal. The goal should be having sustainable pasture lands in future, having enough water in future, having a functioning ecosystem in future, having wildlife that can also then bring back economy that was lost in the past. And it should be more on the on the vision and on the on the on the resources that get available than to put it into that's the border we fight for the border or we use the politics to 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 sneak in that's not what we try to do but i agree with you it's often the case there are a lot a lot of examples especially in africa where poor countries are actually then in conservation kind of second and the the, the major work of like law enforcement thing is done by 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 external people and i think it's a thin line but it's also that we cannot just ignore the situation central africa is very complex without investment from outside the people will suffer even more and i think the most important is to have land use plans where you include as many people as many stakeholders as possible Yeah, maybe it's just a biological question. You you showed that um, you know fire is used by probably uh, people like uh, agriculture to get new grass growing. But it seems that it's also important for a lot of herbivores. So they like usually the where the grass was burned. So they aggregate on this on these places. So if you it seems your strategy does not involve uh, controlled burning in in the park, does it not lead to problems that? Uh, species go outside of the park if there's a lot of uh, even though there's people there might be good quality grass on the, on the what we try is to bring back the natural fire system the interesting thing is if you ask around nobody know what the natural fire system is we know that humans use fire since 200,000 years we, th we think in central africa they have major fire since maybe 20,000 years so what is natural nobody knows what we try is to create a big block where there is no human induced fire, but we also don't fight natural fires to actually figure out what would be natural fire. But there is one big problem. If we don't have thousands of elephants, thousands of buffalo, then you will actually also not have natural fire because they would have an impact on how the vegetation looks like. So we try to have a compromise. Here you see the fires. The darker it is, that's the, the, the later in the season. The lighter it is, the earlier in the season. And you see, for example, that we try to have early fires to make fire breaks. These fire breaks then help herbivores to find good quality grass. But we, have, we try to have big blocks where we don't burn. Now you see that all the surrounding actually burns. And these areas burn all the time because people light fire. Then you have the big fires that come from outside. But interestingly, this fire here, for example, was a lightning strike and it burned in, in um, April. In April, normally you no longer have fires because people already burned everything. So we have now an interesting thing that lightning strikes start to have fires all over the, the, the time. Yesterday, I got the information that we got another lightning fire. So it's now rainy season, a lot of water, but there's enough dry um, uh, grass and um, uh, grass that when the uh, lightning hits and there was no rain for two days, it gives a local fire. This local fire is extremely hot, kills maybe even trees, but gets extremely quickly um, uh, stopped. And then the humidity allows the vegetation to come back. So I think that the dynamics will be much, much more diverse and will be a mosaic of burned, unburned if we just let quite the natural processes going on. And here, just for you to show, these are all the fires in the area from 2001 to 2022 plotted along this graph. And the only thing that I would like to say, so that's um, uh, the month, this is December. This is like peak of the dry season, as you see when the, the, the rainfall. And what we see here is in the old time, in 2001 to 2005, the fire where 
at that time. Then we have the increase of the herders and poacher into the area. And now with the management, we shifted again. So when you see now, we had a more late dry season fire shifted to more human activity, early dry season, and with management, late dry season fires. And I think that's where it's interesting to see fire. So we are not against fires, but we would like to figure out what is a natural fire system. And I think this natural fire system would actually create more diversity than when you have early fires, because early fires is only for grass. All the trees survive. So you have afforestation. Late dry season fires can kill trees, can actually create new grasslands. So maybe for herbivores, it's even more important to have fewer hot later dry season fire than all burned in the dry season, because also then with the heavy rains, there's a lot of erosion because of these fires. Thank you.